Okay, I'm going to continue and um, we'll start with a couple of literary poems. And uh, this first one's called The Novelist. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a novelist. I said, you must be imagining things. <laughs> I live in Folkestone, and um, as does Laura, who's here tonight. And uh, one of the things about Folkestone is it's had a history in the um, the greatest novel ever written, possibly, Ulysses, um, was seized in Folkestone by customs in 1923, the third edition, I think. And um, customs, uh, there are 500 copies in the third edition, and they took 499. Now, the question is. Anybody hopefully can work out that if you take 499 from 500, you're probably left with two or three, I think. But anyway, uh, what has happened to that one copy? So this is Ulysses in Folkestone. Ulysses came to Folkestone in 1923. 500 copies arriving at customs. 499 seized for obscenity. What happened to number 500? Does it lurk somewhere in the old town? buried in a bookshop, passed on through generations, revered as a Bible with its knickers down, corners turned for the dirty bits, long superseded by everyday porn. Imagine that curious customs officer passing copy 500 among his friends, wondering about Dublin, wondering whether all its girls were as generous as Molly Bloom. <laughs> Called yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, when I was a, a little boy, um, having a Beatles jacket was a thing to have. So um, there you are, this is the kicking starting off point for yeah, yeah, yeah. Pride of my wardrobe, a cord Beatles jacket with gold buttons. Joy only partly diminished because I wasn't actually a Beatle. My grey school trousers, no match for my top. There lay the problem, a heart crowded with desires. The reality a slumbering suburb where male readers kept their distance from working class heroes i was halfway to heaven happy to sign up when the call came but the beatles moved on gave up beatles jackets gave up being beatles the dream was over i woke in an office <coughs> numbed by regulations and routine the starry world seemed very far away no screaming fans as I boarded the train. I was in a restaurant recently, and uh, after we finished eating, the waiters brought us a couple of after eight mints. And if you think about it, um, we've had from landlines to smartphones, from somebody landing on the moon to space stations, and uh, probably from the invention of uh, a motor car till now, after eight minutes have just been there. They've survived. <laughs> and I, I guarantee if there's a nuclear holocaust, there'll be only two survivors. There'll be cockroaches and after eight minutes. And Keith Richards. And Keith Richards. <laughs> eating after eight minutes. <laughs> so this is after eight. In after dinner moments or pre seduction warmth, where would lovers be without you? Sensuous after eight. A sexy sliver in black and gold, making eyes across the brandy, sliding you between parting lips, foretasting what's to come between the sheets. What if a second mint is taken? Does that suggest sweet minty sex until dawn sets in? Smooth on the outside, soft within, not to eat you would be a sin, again and again, again and again. <laughs> I went to a Catholic secondary modern called Thomas More School, and um, I was interested, therefore, to read that uh, Thomas More, who wrote poetry as well as being a senior politician and um, uh, disowned by Henry VIII, uh, also was a very fine poet. And the last few days of his life, when he's locked in the Tower of London, all his books and papers removed from him, he continued to write poetry using a bit of uh, coal on the, on the wall of the cell. So uh, this is more in sorrow. Denied paper, the prisoner adapted to straightened circumstances, 
writing with coal, marking his final days on a prison wall, resolute as befits a coming saint, dipping into principles set out by faith. In faith I bless you a thousand times, he wrote, for lending me now some leisure to make rhymes. I first rhymed at a school named Thomas More. We had pens and paper, deaths to hide behind. We sinners gave little thought to saints, martyred or otherwise, were due too busy anticipating the next surprise, shuffled from a teenage deck of cards to spare a prayer for tortured bards. Now to picture a prisoner versifying with coal seems profound. To hear the scratch of carbon on brick before committing to unyielding ground. Moore wrote less after losing his head, as poets do when newly dead, till comes the resurrection of their reputation, schools named in honour, now there's completion. <laughs> to open a window, do feel free. I don't know how the stuffiness factor is setting in, but if you're fine, fine. we'll carry on. Um, <coughs> <coughs> refugee is living in fear every second of every day. Refugee is seeing your children killed, terrified for the ones that live. Refugee is realising that escape is a place with no name. Refugee is fleeing with just a suitcase and your loved ones. Refugee is losing all you own, your home, its memories. Refugee is giving your money to a gangster, letting that gangster risk your life in a leaky boat. Refugee is the jubilation of survival as you scrabble onto dry land. Refugee is the kindness of islanders offering shelter and warmth. Refugee is continuing your journey on a pitiless road, bullet-faced men guarding razor wire fences. Refugee is watching a continent pull up its drawbridges. Refugee is freezing camps in winter, all dignity stripped away. <coughs> Refugee is wicked politicians peddling a currency of hate. Refugee is the miracle of completing the obstacle course. Refugee is being lifted by strong hands Words soothing as balm, welcome friend, welcome home, come share our land. Okay, this is my final poem tonight, and um, I was listening to an interview on the radio where Brendan Dean, who used to be leader of a trade union called SOGAP, was reminiscing about her childhood. And she was saying that um, she used to get taken to Blackpool by her dad and have donkey rides. And um, she used to say to her dad, um, Dad, where do the donkeys go in the evening? I thought that's a brilliant question. And I thought I'd try and answer it in a poem. So I've written a poem called, Where Do Donkeys Go in the Evening? Where do donkeys go in the evening when the time of sands runs out? Have they homes in the hills and meadow banks beside rivers teeming with trout? When the beaches are deserted, do these humble beasts secretly gather, complain of being sat on by humans whose heels cut in like a dagger? And do one or two stand out? Say, comrades, we must organise. Since the Bible made us popular, we've led nothing but troubled lives. It was all the fault of that Jesus spending Easter in Jerusalem. He may be God to the humans, to us he was just one more bum. But it's business as usual tomorrow among the deck chairs and lollipops, where children gain childhood memories to the rhythm of shuffled tick tops Where donkeys go in the evening may come as a major surprise. Don't be fooled by their ridiculous ears. Revolution brews behind those soft eyes. Hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw. <laughs> Wearing the underpants. They may well be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, anyway, um, on that slightly uh, unpleasant note, I don't know what Laura said, but the sound of the donkey impression, I'd like to hand over now.